It seems like a fairy tale for modern Sheffield folk, that once upon a time their modern industrial city had one of the largest medieval castles in the country, with its adjoining 2,400-acre deer park and opulent manor lodge, all of which was the baronial seat of the Earls of Shrewsbury, one of the richest, most powerful families in Tudor England. But if it was a fairy tale, it came to an end in 1616, with the death of Gilbert Tolbert, the seventh Earl of Shrewsbury, who died without an heir. By then a fast-growing population in late Tudor England, combined with severe economic recession and fall in incomes, meant things were grim for the people of Sheffield. A local survey in 1615 found that out of a population of 2,207 people, only 10 had enough land for a cow, 100 householders were wealthy enough to look after themselves as well as help the poor, another 100 householders could only just provide for themselves, leaving 725 who were effectively paupers, and 1,222 children and servants relying on the others for support. Gilbert's brother, the 8th Earl, lasted just one more year, and then the lands of Sheffield and Hallamshire were dispersed via the marriages of Gilbert's three daughters, Mary, Elizabeth and Alethea, to noble families with no real interest in Sheffield or its castle, and happy to give up most local obligations. In the first video, we set up a hypothesis that the fortunes of the wealthy owners of the castle might rub off on the people of Sheffield. But sometimes the rich and powerful only become so at the expense of the poor and the powerless. For instance, in 1565, George Talbot, the famous sixth Earl of Shrewsbury, despite being one of the richest men in England with an income today of well over £5 million a year, resurrected an obsolete right and demanded from his tenants a benevolence towards his daughter's marriage portion. The impoverished folk of Sheffield resisted and were immediately threatened with court action. Well, of course, they gave in. In 1594, Gilbert Tolbert, the seventh Earl, fell out with his Sheffield tenantry so spectacularly that Queen Elizabeth had to intervene on their behalf. For that and other misdemeanours, the Queen then threw him out of her court for two years in 1595. In other words, although the later Tolberts loved their homes in Sheffield, it seems there was little love lost between them and the townspeople. The survey of 1615 also shows a very surprising thing, that while there were maybe as many as 360 skilled artisans in the town, and Sheffield cutlery had been famous in England for over 300 years, there were virtually no wealthy merchants or manufacturers in the town. This could be put down to the fact that the Earls of Shrewsbury owned most, if not all, the 28 water mills and forges in and around Sheffield. William Dickinson, bailiff of Hallamshire in 1574, noted in his records that they also kept iron and steel in the storeroom of Sheffield Castle, to be sold on wholesale and retail to the cutlers, and that the earls charged considerable sums for the use of the hammers, furnaces and mills on manor lands. In other words, it seems the castle tightly controlled Sheffield's cutlery trade, thereby restricting wealth creation by the townspeople. So maybe by 1600s the influence of the Talbot family had become detrimental to the town. But we shouldn't be too hard on the 7th Earl. It was he who bequeathed £200 a year for the setting up of the original Shrewsbury Hospital for the benefit of 20 poor people, although they had to wait another 55 years for it to be built. Mind you, he also bequeathed 13 cups of gold worth £100 each for his children, grandchildren and executors, so he could easily afford it. And that's £100 in 1616, more than £20,000 each in today's money. Another clue to the town's feelings towards the castle was the speed at which the burghers of Sheffield, led by Sir John Saville, capitalising on the lack of male Talbot heirs, had an Act of Parliament passed in 1624 which set up the company of cutlers, who were then allowed to control their own trades in and around Sheffield. It was a great success. Nearly 500 people signed up in the first two years and membership fees allowed the first Cutler's Hall to be built on the site of the current hall in 1638. This freedom also encouraged the people of Sheffield to express new religious and political views. Reformist and Puritan zeal were set against the established church. 
and the first Presbyterian chapel in the area was established in Attercliffe in 1630. In the civil war against King Charles I in 1642, even wealthy Sheffield families such as the Brights of Carbrook and the Jessops of Broom Hall supported Parliament and the rest of Sheffield followed to the extent of taking over the castle in July 1642. But in April 1643, Royalist troops under William Cavendish, Earl of Newcastle, recaptured the castle for the King with his wife Margaret noting that Finding near that place some ironworks, he gave present order for the casting of iron cannon for his garrisons, and for the making of other instruments and engines of war. Well, who carried this out is difficult to say. Most of the townspeople had fled into the next county. But it's interesting that the Earl thought it possible, though. Making cannons was a highly skilled job. A poorly made cannon was more likely to kill its gunners than the enemy. But there are no records of such armaments ever being made in Sheffield. Is this another curious gap in Sheffield's history? After months of siege, in August 1644, 1,200 parliamentary troops breached the castle walls with their own large cannon, and the Royalist supporters surrendered. Since its new Royalist owners, the Howard family, had left hurriedly for the continent, and the castle was considered a military threat, its demolition was ordered by Parliament in 1647. In the next few years, the lead, timber, stone and fittings were sold off for better purpose, including the rebuilding of the Free Grammar School on Townhead Street. The Manor Lodge met the same fate 60 years later. Without much regret, it appears, the whole castle was razed to the ground and the area became the town's recreation centre with a bowling green laid out over the ruins. In just a few years, the people of Sheffield had gained their freedom from Talbot rule and the final vestiges of feudalism, and had seen the symbol of this oppression demolished and cleared away. The town was finally able to embark on years of growth and independence. Well, lastly, here's a trivia quiz tidbit for you. When the castle surrendered in 1644 to parliamentary troops, the surrender agreement refers to a man called Kellum Homer. Homer was Sheffield's town armourer and, unfortunately for him, had chosen the wrong side in the Civil War. He must have been forgiven though because he later gave his name to Kellam Island when he set up a grinding mill there. Kellam Island is now famous for its Sheffield Industrial Museum and, of course, its fine brewery. Well, that's it for now. Hopefully you found something of interest in our three videos on medieval Sheffield. Thanks for watching.